Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, LGBTQ plus family building. Before we get started, I would like to go over a few quick items about today's event. First, all physicians in attendance will receive an AMA PRA category one credit and all other providers will receive a certificate of completion for one contact hour credit. The certificate will be emailed to you by Harvard around midsummer. Additionally, we encourage you to submit questions to Dr. Risakova using the Q&A box. You may send in your questions at any time during the presentation, and we will collect these and address them during the Q&A session at the end of the presentation. Now, without further ado, I'd like to introduce you to today's speaker. Dr. Nina Risakova is a reproductive endocrinologist at Boston IVF and sees patients at our downtown Boston location. Dr. Risa Kova has a special interest in caring for the LGBTQ plus patient population. Her novel research examining transgender fertility preservation outcomes have been published in peer reviewed journals, journals, presented at national meetings and received significant interest from the press. Okay, let's get started. I'll pass it over to Dr. Risa Kova. Thank you so much, Emily. Thanks for the introduction and um, Thanks everybody for joining in today. Um, happy Pride Month. Uh, we've had a lot of celebrations. Uh, our clinic has been involved in a lot of the Pride celebrations uh, throughout um, our state and neighboring states um, where our member clinics are located. Um, and hi everyone who's in attendance today. I see uh, some familiar names. So I um, hope you enjoy the talk and there will be opportunity for some questions um, towards the end as well. So feel free to add them to the Q&A um, and we'll, we should leave a little bit of time at the end for answering any of your questions. So the talk, title of my talk today is LGBTQ plus family building. Um, I have a special interest in this topic, both um, academically um, as well as uh, in terms of patient care. And a large portion of my practice uh, is devoted to the care of LGBTQ plus family building as well. Um, as Emily mentioned, I see patients in uh, the downtown Boston location and uh, very accessible uh, virtually as well um, uh, for uh, new patient appointments. Okay, um, so we'll get started here. Okay, here's a few of my disclosures today, uh, none of which will affect the content of our talk. So our objectives for today's talk are to learn more about the various treatment options available for LGBTQ plus individuals and couples. Um, I'm going to talk with you specifically about some of the trends that we're seeing here in our practice and also discuss the results of some of our studies on LGBTQ plus family building to give you some perspective at our clinic and also um, some, some national and even some international uh, data as well on this topic. And ultimately, um, I want you to feel that you've had um, some insight into patient management and clinical recommendations, um, as well as the opportunity to ask any uh, specific questions as well. And if you have any things offline that you want to ask about, i um, happy to connect as well. Um, just feel free to send an email to our team and um, we can connect directly afterwards. So the community that we're speaking about today, the LGBTQ plus uh, community, um, is a very broad and growing community. Um, in, as of 2022, the Gallup poll um, indicated that there's about 7% of Americans identify as part of the community, um, and that percentage has doubled over time. So uh, with, the, with the surveys every 10 years or so, there's increasing numbers of folks who identify as being part of this community. Um, as far as for transgender identification, about 0.6% of US, 0 .6 of US adults identify as transgender. And um, in fact, uh, the survey data suggests higher rates um, in, in the younger population as well. Um, so it seems like those trends may, may increase over time. This is sort of a heat map from the Williams Institute that collects this data. And you can see that there's more folks who identify as part of the LGBTQ plus community. It's a little bit more flanking um, the coastal states. Um, and uh, in most states, there's at least four or 5% of people who identify as being part of the community, but more, more sequestered or located towards the, the coast, not unexpectedly. In our population here at Boston IVF, about 10% of our patients identify as part of the community um, because some of our patients 
need our services. There's really no other way that they can, you know, conceive um, genetically related children. So we, um, very high proportion of our patients identify, and we've been taking care of the LGBTQ plus community since our inception um, over 30 years ago, um, and have participated in family building uh, very proudly for, for, for thousands of families. Some of the needs of the community um, is for respect and uh, for recognition. Um, recognition of their identities, um, of their relationship status, and uh, along with that comes a use of the correct pronouns and terminology to address them. Um, other aspects of this also include the availability of procedures. You know, of course, we're a full spectrum fertility care center, so we're able to offer um, all the, the treatment options um, to fulfill their needs um, and really partner in the process of family building for our LGBTQ plus community. Um, something that I find very important um, in caring for uh, folks in this community is to review all the available treatment options so they have a good understanding of the spectrum of treatment options that are available to them. And sometimes this requires kind of thinking outside of the box, working with sort of the available anatomy um, and, you know, potentially even incorporating both partners in the family building process where that may not have been initially what their intended pathway was, but sort of thinking outside the box and offering all available options um, tends to be really appreciated. Some of the options we're gonna talk about today uh, focus on fertility treatment and some also focus on fertility preservation. We'll be talking specifically about lesbian patients, gay patients, transgender patients, and then um, touching on some uh, non-binary and gender non-conforming patients and um, ways to streamline and make their care um, very accessible. So I want to share with you some of the trends that we're seeing at our, our centers um, across the country. So what you're looking at is the proportion of treatment cycles, total treatment cycles at our center um, that are uh, undergone by LGBTQ plus patients. Um, particularly, we're looking at um, patients in same sex couples, the majority of which are in same sex female couples. Um, what you're seeing in the dark blue line, um, which I can indicate for you here, is our New England practice where we're seeing um, uh, over 9% of the treatment cycles completed uh, by, by patients in same-sex relationships. And uh, our other satellite centers, so uh, we have a center in Ohio and New York, um, over 7% of the treatment cycles are completed by LGBTQ plus individuals. And then our Delaware practice, um, a little lower, and then our, our Colorado practice, a little lower, but certainly growing trends over time um, and more treatment cycles are being uh, utilized by this population. So certainly very notable, and I'm sure it's something that you're seeing um, also growing in your individual practices. So we'll start off with uh, treatment for our lesbian couples, our same-sex female uh, uh, partnered um, patients. Really the initial starting place for most um, uh, women in same-sex relationships is really starting off with donor insemination. And that's because the majority of patients um, are going to be uh, presumed to be fertile, uh, so they have not had exposure to sperm in the past. That may be a little different if they've had prior attempts with home insemination or if they have a known donor and they've been doing treatment um, uh, prior to presenting with the fertility clinic. But for the most part, these are people who are naive to treatment, uh, naive to sperm, have never had uh, exposure to sperm and thus are not infer infertile. Um, the best approach inside a fertility clinic is to do an intrauterine insemination. That means actually placing the sperm um, from a syringe of sperm up into uh, the uterus. And that allows for a sort of a compacted amount of millions of sperm to be inserted into um, the lower portion of the uterus, therefore bypassing the cervix, um, and allow for a really good timing between the release of the egg um, and the placement of the sperm. So that there's typically millions of viable sperm that are able to reach the egg that is ultimately um, ovulated and travels through the fallopian tube to uh, where the sperm kind of travels to the egg, but then ultimately the fertilized egg will travel through the tubes and implant in the uterus. Um, a lot of patients who are doing home insemination will typically be doing like vaginal placement of the sperm. So with an intrauterine placement of the sperm, more sperm are able to reach the egg and the success rates are higher. Um, there's been some changes with what we're seeing with the insurers about how many treatment cycles are required before eligibility for IVF. Um, and 
unfortunately, those changes are becoming more progressive over time. So for patients who are under 35 years of age, generally somewhere between three to six cycles of insemination are uh, recommended or required before eligibility for um, more aggressive treatments. And if somebody is over 35 years of age, because the chances of the success per cycle are lower, uh, generally about three to four cycles are recommended um, or required before moving on to IVF treatment. It's possible to do various sort of permutations of an insemination cycle. The most typical approach is to do some cycle-related monitoring, so tracking for luteinizing hormone or the LH surge, um, and monitoring with ultrasound the development of the follicle and the hormone levels associated. So most people have monitored cycles to increase the efficiency of the cycle and the success rate per cycle, and will often administer a trigger shot to enhance the timing of the egg release. And you can also use some medication like clomiphene citrate or letrozole to increase the number of eggs that are being released, though typically not for the initial cycles. That's typically something that's added on um, over the course of time to decrease the risk of multiple pregnancy. So let's talk about success rates of this option. Um, so there's a, a large study that compared the success rates for um, same-sex uh, female patients um, versus uh, single females. Um, this was published in 2000, so a little bit of a dated study, but still um, using very contemporary approaches. They compared um, 675 cycles in um, single women and then 139 cycles in, in lesbian patients. Um, the lesbian patients compared to the single women were a little bit younger at the time of initiation of treatment, 34 versus about 38 years of age. So that was significant. And correspondingly, the clinical pregnancy rate was lower in single women who were starting off about four years older um, than it was in lesbian couples where the, the cumulative pregnancy rate was higher. Um, the cumulative pregnancy rate after six completed cycles was about 70% for the women in same-sex relationships versus a, close to 50% uh, for single single patients. Um, not um, unsurpri so unsurprisingly, the miscarriage rate was higher in single women who were starting treatment at a later age compared to lesbian patients who were younger, and the miscarriage rate was lower. Um, this study has been updated um, uh, more recently, there's been a lot more contemporary data coming out on the LGBTQ patient population. Fortunately, this was really sort of a sparse uh, data zone, uh, but more and more data is coming out. And uh, this large study was published in 2021. Um, this is a West Coast um, collection of data. 11,000 IUI cycles were included, 11,400 11, of which were in heterosexual uh, couples and 393 in lesbian women. Uh, the average age, though, was quite similar between the groups in this study, about 36 uh, for both. And interestingly, what we found, um, what they found was that lesbian women had a positive HCG rate of close to 15%, positive pregnancy rate of close to 15% per cycle. Um, and um, the heterosexual women had a positive pregnancy rate of about 12% per cycle, and also a higher miscarriage rate in the heterosexual couples. So basically, the lesbian group had a higher odds of clinical pregnancy, and that's likely um, associated with a you know, decreased rate of, uh, uh, of actual infertility in this population. The majority of the heterosexual patients had a, an infertility diagnosis, whereas the lesbian patients typically did not. Um, when we look at some um, graphical representation of this data, um, what we're looking at on the left side of the screen is the cumulative pregnancy rate for patients under age 35. And on the right side of the screen, the cumulative pregnancy rate for patients over 35. So you can see um, with the, the, green, um, the green trend line that the success rates cumulatively is higher uh, for the younger patients than it is for, for the older patients. Um, and the success rate does really plateau um, after roughly, you know, cycle four to six. Um, so the success rates beyond that are pretty low incrementally. And the success rates in this particular study really uh, plateaued around the 40% range. 
When we looked at our own data internally at Boston IVF, we found something very similar. Um, when we looked at all of our lesbian patients undergoing treatment with insemination, the success rate really kind of plateaued around 42, 43%. And so completing any treatment cycle is beyond kind of cycle number four, cycle number five did not have a meaningful influence on the treatment outcome. And that's really informed the way that we, you know, provide care and counsel our patients because it's one thing if they're doing uh, additional IUIs to fulfill an insurance requirement and allow them to move forward with IVF, but it's another thing if they're paying out of pocket for each treatment cycle with insemination when IVF would really be the next best um, outcome and a much more successful outcome. So a couple of notes on donor insemination. Uh, firstly, it's very well tolerated. So patients typically have very, very little symptoms associated with the treatment cycle. Um, and it fits in pretty well to their uh, to their life. There's not a major impact. They're able to come in early in the morning for blood work and ultrasound and typically take a couple of hours off for the insemination process itself. Um, the cost of a vial of sperm has really changed um, over the last few years. And as I uh, give this talk over time, the, 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 this is the part that's really changed the most is the average cost of the vial of sperm. Um, when I started practicing, um, or initially when I was doing my training, probably it was about $800 per vial. And now there's vials that are easily at $1,500 or $1,800 per vial. And so really with COVID, there was such a, a influence on recruitment of sperm donors. Um, so it really kind of pushed up the prices. So that's definitely something we have to factor in to the total cost of treatment. On the clinic side, the average cost of insemination is somewhere between $500 to $1,500 per cycle, depending on how much monitoring is taking place. Um, and many insurances, including some of our larger insurers, actually do cover the cost of the treatment um, for, for patients, but rarely is donor sperm um, itself covered. And some of the workplace benefits are starting to offer some coverage for that, but, um, but it's kind of sparse. So most patients will be paying out of pocket for the sperm, even if they have treatment coverage. Um, there are different ways to get sperm. Um, you can choose uh, what we used to call anonymous, probably now better called non-identified sperm donor um, through a sperm bank. Uh, that's the approach that most of our patients take. It's faster and it's cheaper at the outset. The initial cost is cheaper, um, but the total cost may actually be cheaper if you're using a known sperm donor because they're able to produce many vials. So if you're thinking about having a larger family, uh, the cost on a per vial basis is going to be decreased if somebody is depositing multiple uh, sperm donations and then the total amount of sperm is kind of parsed out over multiple multiple vials. Um, known donor sperm uh, may take a little bit longer to get off the ground. So the donor has to do some testing to confirm that he is eligible, um, do some genetic testing, has to come in for some um, social work evaluation as well. Um, but uh, again, more vials of sperm may be produced as a result. Um, we also have, uh, as of last year, a known donor sperm program in-house at Boston IVF. So if your patients are interested in participating in that, um, definitely reach out to us. and We can set them up uh, with our coordinator to learn a little bit more about the program, any of the costs associated and the timelines as well. We instituted that because we were just having so many patients who weren't able to um, quarantine and bank sperm at local sperm banks. They just were giving them sort of wait lines and cues. So we institute that as part of our, our services that we offer. So happy to help out your patients if anybody is interested. Um, and then ultimately, um, in vitro fertilization, as I, I touched on, would typically be recommended if patients are not pregnant after three to six cycles of insemination, because the uh, marginal success rate for an, for an IUI is typically pretty low at that point, and the treatment success rate with IVF may simply be much better. Um, so typically, we recommend, um, it's quite individualized, but we recommend for patients to move on to the next step, which is in vitro fertilization, if not successful after three to six inseminations. Many patients ask, what if I do two inseminations in one treatment cycle? What if I sort of maximize my exposure to sperm? Will that make a difference? 
well, gosh, it'll really increase the cost, right? We talked about the cost of um, uh, per vial costs, $1,000 to $1,800 per vial. So it'll really increase the cost of treatment. But interestingly, this has been studied and the success rate, it, while it goes up slightly um, when two inseminations are performed instead of one in one treatment cycle, um, it's not statistically significant, the increase. Um, and based on the increased costs and the increased sort of impact on um, you know, patient scheduling, taking time off work, I generally don't recommend it unless we're thinking about doing this as kind of a closure step um, or maybe if there's no coverage for in vitro fertilization afterwards and we want to sort of maximize the IUI pathway. So we, we occasionally do this, but it's not a routine part of our practice. So I want to talk with you about a treatment option that's really gaining a lot of popularity in our lesbian community, and that's partner-assisted reproduction. Um, it has a lot of names uh, in the literature um, and also on, on, on chats with patients, uh, also called co-IVF, um, historically shared motherhood IVF or reciprocal IVF as well. Um, at our clinic, typically we call PAR or partner-assisted reproduction. And it's where one partner undergoes a stimulation of um, their ovaries for an egg retrieval. So essentially doing the first part of the IVF treatment cycle. Uh, the eggs are then retrieved and combined with sperm in the laboratory to create embryos. And the second partner undergoes preparation of their uterine lining for an embryo transfer. Essentially, one partner needs to have ovaries and the other partner needs to have a uterus. Um, and the other reproductive organs, you know, can or may not may not be present um, for this treatment. The most common pathway to do this is to coordinate it over, um, over multiple cycles such that the embryos are created first. We kind of review the quality score of the embryos, potentially any genetic testing that's been done for the embryos, and then make a plan for embryo transfer for the other partner once we know what has been the, the outcome of the cycle. However, it is possible to do it all in one where we kind of combine it all into real time. So one partner's uterine lining is being prepared as the other partner is having the egg retrieval and real time a day five embryo where a blastocyst is transferred into the uterine lining. And if that's it's, that's highly desired, um, we, we, can, we can coordinate that and make that happen as well with a pretty high degree of success. Partner-assisted reproduction provides an opportunity for tremendous involvement of both partners in the family building process and is really a very, very special um, approach for patients who are, are motivated for this um, and just a really um, uh, something that's it's very um, uh, and nice to participate in um, from the family, from the from the treatment side. Um, it is typically more expensive than insemination because it uses in vitro fertilization, thus the laboratory, so much higher cost of the technology. Um, but we are seeing some workplace benefits and in fact, some insurances that are offering this as an additional benefit. So um, many patients, even with Massachusetts insurances, have riders through their insurance that are offering this type of reproductive option. And then a lot of the workplace benefits like progeny and carrot and some other um, uh, family building platforms are starting to offer um, some benefits that include this as well. So, um, so we're seeing it more and more and thus the utilization is also increasing. Um, so this is just a kind of a little uh, graphic here. On the left side is a partner who's going to be um, having the egg retrieval, has to have a demonstrated good ovarian reserve, some genetic testing as well to understand there's no overlapping carrier conditions with the donor. And on the other side, the receiving partner has to have a normal uterus um, uh, be cleared and healthy for pregnancy. As far as success rates, um, one of the earlier studies on this topic was published in 2017. It was actually from a UK-based clinic that offered this treatment option. And at the time, they called it shared motherhood IVF. Um, that's a, that has a lot of sort of uh, gender connotations. So um, probably more appropriate would be something like co-IVF or reciprocal IVF. Um, but they, they did have a lot of treatment at this clinic over a six-year period, 172 cycles. And most of them were coordinated real time. They actually had a lot of patients coming in from um, neighboring countries in Europe. Um, so they try to do this like a, a, as a real time option. And at that time, they were still doing a lot of double embryo transfers, which um, changed a lot over the course of the study. And the majority were single embryo transfers towards the latter portion of the study. And their cumulative life birth rate was, was, was quite strong at 60% with still pretty high twin rate at that time, but decreasing over the course of the study. Um, and then uh, the, um, you know, there's been a lot more studies um, in, in this topic. 
And so we're able to see that um, the success rates are actually you know, you know, quite strong. And we've also had some studies done now, Boston IVF that are heading towards publication that have looked at the outcomes in uh, reciprocal or co-IVF. And we've had an opportunity to evaluate those outcomes really head to head with other groups, um, including our heterosexual couples, our single women undergoing treatment, um, and also our patients undergoing treatment with egg donation. And what you see here in the red is the success rates per cycle for our reciprocal IVF group, 57%, versus our heterosexual patients, 43%, even with egg donation, 41%. So um, reciprocal IVF, really with a good quality embryo um, and a well-structured um, uterus without you know, a lot of history of uterine factor, um, results in higher success rates in a statistically significant way um, compared to our other patient groups where it was studied. So really high success rate for this for this option for patients who are motivated and and and, and we'll have some coverage for it. As far as alternative forms of family building for lesbian couples, um, in, in some cases, um, if neither partner um, has a good ovarian reserve or um, you know has a good quality eggs any longer than donor egg may be considered, and occasionally gestational surrogacy as well. Um, but that, that's a little bit more rare in this population. So let's transition to male-male couples um, and talk a little bit about the treatment options that are available. So for couples in which there's two, um, uh, two men, so two folks who are assigned male at birth, there, there typically is going to be very good quality sperm from one or potentially both partners. Typically, they don't have a history of, of male factor infertility. Um, but we do need um, some other parties to assist in the, in the family um, building process. So we need to work with an egg donor and also a gestational carrier. And these folks can be known to the couple or they can be, uh, again, more appropriately non-identified to the couple um, being recruited by an agency. Um, and the agency is typically involved with the recruitment of one or both of these individuals, unless they happen to know somebody, you know, through uh, their network or a family member who's willing to participate in the process, which is, which is just wonderful when that works out well. There's extensive social work evaluation required for both the, the donor and then also, you know, the couple or the individual who's participating in this process. So it's a, a, a much longer timeline um, to achieve, um, achieve good outcomes in this population because a lot of um, FDA regulation, a lot of additional screening requirements are necessary. Um, speaking to egg donation, this can be done in what we call fresh or frozen. Um, fresh or live egg donation is when um, an individual undergoes um, an IVF stimulation and then has her eggs retrieved, and then all those eggs become um, then the property of the intended parents who are pursuing treatment. Or they can work with a frozen donor egg bank and purchase egg lot, an egg lot that's typically comprised of sort of five to eight eggs, um, and then um, inseminate those eggs with their sperm to make multiple embryos. And there's some pros and cons of both pathways. Um, typically, live egg donation or fresh egg donation is much more expensive. Um, and then frozen is, is faster, less expensive, but you're getting less embryos. So a lot of this comes down to you know, how they desire to build their family and what size of family we're, we're looking towards. Um, in my experience, uh, both men often wish to be biological parents. There's instances in which that's not the case, but um, typically we're doing some, some form of uh, split insemination. So uh, typically the egg lot will somehow be divided um, and then split um, you know, according to their desire so that both men are able to have embryos derived from their sperm to help them build their families. As far as surrogacy, um, there's sort of two ways to go through surrogacy, um, one of which is very, very rarely practiced in the United States, and that's traditional surrogacy. That's where the egg donor and the person carrying the pregnancy are the same. Um, and that is really carries no legal protection for the intended parents. So it's really scarcely practiced at all. We don't participate in that through Boston IVF. Um, and then gestational surrogacy, where the person who's carrying the pregnancy is not the person who is um, donating the eggs. 
surrogacy laws vary um, quite a bit throughout the country. Um, you can see in the green are states that are favorable to surrogacy, and fortunately, it's the majority of states. Um, there are some states where it would be advisable to take some caution with proceeding, um, and then there are some states in which there are really you know, no protections for the intended parents, and um, it would not be advised by a an attorney, a reproductive health attorney, to participate in in any sort of surrogacy contracts, and that really comes down to really where the the surrogate uh, carrier lives. So there are some states like um, Nebraska, Michigan, and Louisiana where the laws are not friendly, and then we wouldn't recommend proceeding in that in that location. But fortunately for for prospective parents, there's um, uh, the trends are that it. Uh, the laws are becoming a little bit more favorable uh, to surrogacy over time. So the success rates with egg donation uh, and surrogacy are ultimately generally pretty high uh, because we're typically working with a good quality egg from a donor who's most often in her 20s or early 30s. The quality of the sperm is typically strong as well with no history of male factor infertility. And then the gestational surrogate is somebody who's carried a pregnancy to term before with um, basically very little to no uh, pregnancy, uh, adverse pregnancy outcomes. So really all factors are pretty optimized. So the success rates are very strong. Um, that also means that most couples are pregnant on their first or second embryo transfer. Um, very rarely do we need to go beyond that. And then we often consider um, kind of changing or modifying some, some, some factors beyond that point. Um, we certainly advocate for single embryo transfers. Almost all of our patients participating in surrogacy undergo a single embryo tra transfer with, with rare deviation from that. So um, we're almost always you know, looking at singleton pregnancies, which is obviously the safest for the children and also um, the surrogate carriers. Treatment is very costly. Actually, the largest part that drives the treatment cost are the compensation to the surrogate um, and then the legal and agency fees. The fertility treatment costs are on the lower side of, of this particular pathway. Um, and many, many um, patients, um, intended parents and surrogate pairs end up working together for multiple journeys um, to help them expand their family. So it's, it's often a really, really beautiful relationship that forms. So let's switch, switch gears a little bit um, to um, giving you some background on working with uh, transgender patients and family building. So we'll start off and touch on uh, a little bit of some of the data on patients who are assigned male at birth and then um, and on uh, patients who are assigned female at birth and review some of the data um, that we have internally as well. So for patients who are assigned male at birth and are transitioning, um, sperm can be obtained by ejaculation if the patient doesn't find that to be too dysphoric, um, or you know, surgical retrieval is an option, particularly if um, ejaculation is no longer an option, um, or um, uh, or there's some surgery planned already, for example, to remove remove the gonads, then sperm can be retrieved around that time as well. Um, typically, it's recommended that um, the patient is off gender affirming hormones. So estrogen and testosterone blockers for a few months. Um, there can be return to sperm function um, earlier than that, but typically the best um, spermatogenesis is gonna come after being off those for about three months and even longer periods may be needed. Um, more data is coming out to show that sperm quality and sperm quantity may also be affected by prolonged est estrogen administration. And that's a pretty consistent finding. We find that about um, the sperm parameters are reduced by about 50% after prolonged estrogen administration. But for most patients who are coming off those affirming hormones, there's still going to be enough sperm available uh, to have successful outcomes with insemination with that, with that sperm. Um, and in almost all cases, still enough sperm for um, uh, IVF treatment. So it's very rare that there would be uh, a, a, a rendered a sterile state um, after being on longer forms of hormone therapy. If uh, this patient is partnered with a female partner, a partner, um, a, a cisgender female a partner with a the uterus, they can conceive with intercourse if that's something that is um, still palatable to them and, and um, not too gender dysphoric. Insemination can be used or IVF, as we discussed, depending on the sperm parameters. That's a huge part of it. So it's really case by case um, for this couple. 
Um, if they have a male partner or partner um, who is assigned male at birth with testes, um, then they can participate in surrogacy with egg donation or alternative forms of family building, adoption, um, et cetera. Uh, for folks who are assigned female at birth and uh, transitioning, um, typically eggs are available um, either through stimulation of the ovaries or from prior fertility preservation, um, or in some cases they're partnered with a cisgender female partner. So we have um, another potential egg source. Um, as far as fertility preservation, um, we can uh, uh, either freeze eggs or uh, freeze ovarian tissue. Um, ovarian tissue freezing is no longer considered um, experimental, and that could be something that's considered if this patient is interested in, in a gonadectomy, so like a hysterectomy um, and a removal of both tubes and ovaries. So that is some, certainly something that can be considered, but and not a lot of centers offer it. So for example, we, we don't do a very tissue cryopreservation. preservation. There's a lot more data on egg freezing, you know, prior to gender affirming surgery um, and, and very, very good outcomes, some of which I'll share with you today. Um, in some cases, people will want to carry pregnancy themselves. So there's lots more contemporary examples of this, but um, this is one, um, I'm a millennial, and this is a story that I remember was, was very surprising to me at the time that I heard about Thomas Beatty, who was a trans man who carried uh, a pregnancy. Um, I believe he subsequently carried a second one as well, and that was on the cover of People magazine. It was pretty sensational. But um, we've had many patients over time who've um, chosen to carry pregnancy themselves um, if they find that not to be too disturbing. Dysphoric. Um, and typically they have um, resumption of regular menses within about one to four months after stopping gender affirming hormones. And um, many people, if they're reasonably young, are able to conceive um, with, with intercourse or uh, with insemination of donor sperm. Um, there are some specific notes that I want to highlight for the trans community. Um, one is something that we talked about with all LGBTQ patients, which is to really have an open and inclusive environment. It requires um, having an educated workforce as well. Um, working with their insurance coverage or workplace benefits. Um, we work with um, many payers, and I think that's been really great for our trans community to find that a lot of them actually do have coverage uh, for fertility preservation through uh, gender affirming care. Um, one thing my trans men really enjoy is the possibility of not inducing amenities prior to treatment. We have ways to track um, the testosterone level as it's decreasing to um, try to minimize the likelihood of getting, getting a natural menses before or after treatment. And that's something that um, they really appreciate, at least having the opportunity to try for that. Um, trans men who have been on testosterone for a long time often have vaginal atrophy, so it's really hard to place a transvaginal probe. So we offer transabdominal monitoring, which is almost always adequate, um, in, with very rare exception, um, just to monitor the size and development of the follicles. And in some cases, less frequent or more flexible monitoring um, uh, is, is available as well. A lot of this ultimately comes down to open uh, communication and rapport with the medical provider. Um, what we're seeing for family building in our trans community is that um, the trend is for uh, treatment at a younger age. So we're seeing a lot more referrals earlier before starting uh, T uh, or ultimately them just, you know, being in, in stable relationships at an earlier age and, and sort of initiating treatment um, uh, correspondingly. And then many trans men have an interest in future family building. Um, I'm going to share a couple of studies with you that I've looked at this topic. Um, one of the best studies, I think, on this topic is, is actually pretty dated. It was um, out of Belgium in 2011. And what I think is really interesting about the study is it came out before the experimental label was really lifted on egg freezing. So these are trans men who had undergone gender affirming surgery, so no longer had ovaries. And um, the majority of them were in a relationship, 20% um, already had children, and over half reported a current desire to have children and, and no longer had that option. So it really speaks to you know, having an open discussion um, with patients who are transitioning about their fertility options down the line and, and offering um, fertility preservation, um, or at least the discussion about it with a provider so they can make an informed decision before they take any sort of absolute steps um, to affirm their gender. Um, another study, um, more contemporary in 2020, um, looked at folks who were both assigned female at birth, um, uh, 
who, excuse, I'm sorry, looked at patients who were assigned female at birth and looked at um, their desire to expand or have a family. And actually about 39% um, had a current or future parental desire. So pretty much in line with the prior study, a lot of trans individuals um, do desire to have a family. And some will be very comfortable with, with adoption. Um, and many people will want to ultimately have a genetic child. What we find in the literature is that very few uh, patients have actually pursued um, freezing of gametes. In this particular study, 9% have, which is actually high. In most of the literature, the rates are somewhere between 2 and 5%. So at least having the discussion is important. Um, and even if they decide not to do it, at least they've had the opportunity to evaluate all options and, and any of the costs or coverage associated with those. So here we come to our study um, on assisted reproductive technology outcomes in female to male transgender patients. Um, this is a study that we published in 2019, um, looking at about eight years of data at Boston IVF. Um, this was really um, a very important study for me. It's a topic that I identified in uh, my fellowship when I initially started here at Boston IVF in 2014. And um, I realized we were treating a lot of um, trans patients with fertility preservation, didn't really see um, really any uh, strong literature on this topic. So towards the end of my training, as I started on as faculty, um, we worked to aggregate this data. Um, so again, an eight-year period um, through an IRB at the BI, and the inclusion criteria were that folks had to identify as a trans man and have completed an ovarian stimulation cycle at our center, either for the intent of egg freezing, embryo freezing, or actually intended transfer to either themselves or a cisgender female partner. So we found in the study that 53 patients over an eight-year period have presented, and about half of them underwent treatment. And that's kind of in line with, with, with what we see um, with other um, published data nationally. The age range was quite broad, um, 14 to 39 years of age, and on average patients completed 1.1 treatment cycles. Majority of these cycles were for egg freezing, and then a few cycles for um, IVF with embryo freezing, and then IVF with embryo transfer. There was quite a range of time the patients had been on testosterone, um, ranging from as little as three months of testosterone to 17 years. The mean time had been three to four years. And the average time off testosterone prior to initiating treatment was about four months. So as far as the results of our study, um, what you see here is a table with um, some of the, um, the, the egg yields. And what you see is that in all of our patients, the average age was 28. The patients coming in for egg freezing will get a little younger, 25. The patients coming in for embryo freezing were 35. And the patients who were having IVF with a transfer of an embryo were a little younger at 32. As far as the egg yields, the mean egg yield was 19. It's actually quite high. Um, typically at our center, the average egg yield, depending on the age, you know, can vary from, you know, age age of sort of 15, maybe 8 to 20 eggs. So this is actually quite high. We were impressed with this number. For egg freezers, the average egg yield was 22 and a little lower for the folks who are making embryos. We then thought it was really important to try to compare this um, to our cisgender cohort. So we matched for three important characteristics for fertility treatment outcomes. So age, body mass index, and AMH. And what we found, interestingly, is that the, um, the transgender folks who had had prior testosterone exposure got a pretty high egg count in relationship to our cisgender patients. So 18 eggs retrieved compared to an average of 14 eggs retrieved in the cisgender cohort. So what we were seeing here is that um, at least the prior androgen exposure did not adversely impact the, um, the number of eggs that were retrieved and possibly positively influenced uh, that number. So no major takeaways you can take from here, but it does not appear to um, decrease uh, the egg yield. What was notable in this cohort, and you can see here that the folks who are um, on prior testosterone exposure, they were getting higher doses of medications, probably because um, they were only covered for one cycle. So it was very important to maximize the number of eggs that were being retrieved and frozen uh, for that one insurance covered cycle. So that was, that was a notable takeaway from our study.
So really at the time this was published, this was really the first of its kind, and it offered sort of a descriptive, maybe even prescriptive approach for some providers working in parts of the country that really you know, didn't have a lot of exposure to this. So it gave a lot of confidence to the community that ovarian stimulation outcomes were strong, um, and we received a lot of um, real positive feedback on this. Limitations, of course, still a relatively small number of patients, right? Over um, uh, at a very experienced center to have 26 patients over eight years, still not, not that high. Um, fortunately, we've had a lot more <laughs> patients go through treatment um, since that time. So our data set is growing. Um, and then very importantly too, not all patients had initiated gender affirming treatment. So um, there you know, wasn't an opportunity to randomize or there really wasn't an opportunity to offer more than the descriptive information that we had um, gleaned from the study. Um, further publications have documented pretty similar uh, supportive findings, and there are some actually case reports now published over the last couple of years for trans men who've continued their testosterone um, while undergoing ovarian stimulation with pretty reasonable outcomes. So it's certainly something that can be done. There's even reports of pediatric uh, fertility preservation, um, even, even regionally uh, for kids who've done um, stimulation while on a continuous GnRH uh, antagonist suppression. So these things are possible um, if the patient's well counseled and just isn't you know, comfortable coming off um, their regimens. This is a little blurry, apologies. Um, this is a follow-up study that um, we, we did um, to evaluate our patients who had um, been on testosterone previously and then had come off testosterone for a shorter or longer period of time prior to pr proceeding with um, egg freezing. And what we found was that not only did the time off testosterone not impact uh, the outcomes in terms of the egg yields, but also if they had been on testosterone previously for a long, long period of time, even greater than five years, it did not seem to adversely impact the egg yield. So very, very supportive of the whole picture that, you know, egg freezing, IVF is still possible, even if the patient's been on testosterone, you know, even for extended periods of time. So I just want to close off with um, kind of a quick review of what happens when you refer a patient to Boston IVF. Um, firstly, they call us, they speak to our centralized booking center, and they're typically scheduled for a 45 minute or one hour initial consultation, where they'll meet with um, one of our NP, PAs, or physicians, depending on the complexity of the case. Um, they're typically scheduled for some initial testing, typically ultrasound and blood work. Um, and then uh, depending on the history, they may be offered some of our ancillary services like counseling, nutritional support, um, et cetera. Um, for treatment timelines, people often want to know if they're doing any gender affirming treatment, surgery, you know, there's some sort of time sensitivity. Um, those who are assigned female at birth and are thinking of doing some egg freezing, the timeline for testing is typically about one month. And then if there's insurance approval timeline, typically about two to four weeks for insurance coordination. And then the treatment itself is roughly two to four weeks. If there's urgency, please let our booking center know. We can try to squeeze patients in. And this is also true for patients with any new cancer diagnoses. Um, those are always um, rushed and expedited. For um, individuals who are considering surrogacy as part of their family building journey, the treatment itself, it doesn't take that long to create embryos, but the surrogacy matching timeline is quite quite a bit longer. Uh, so it takes about 12 to 18 months. So that is something that if you have patients who are interested, um, refer early because it's a longer timeline and we need to work with an agency um, uh, to recruit you know, potential donor and or surrogate. So that process is, is lengthy. We've done a lot of work in our practice to make um, our, ourselves an LGBTQ plus friendly practice. Um, we're continuously striving to improve our care to this community. A lot of it comes down to patient education, um, the signage, um, uh, neutral greetings, all gender restrooms, and we're really continuously improving our paperwork, documentation, um, and uh, striving to make it the best experience for our patients. So once more, um, Happy Pride Month. It's been my pleasure to present to all of you today. And um, let me know if you have any questions. Um, and certainly you can circle back to our marketing team if you want to connect um, offline about any specific uh, patients or referrals or anything that we can help you with. Thank you so much, Dr. Rusakova. Um, we're going to begin answering the submitted questions. Um, you can still ask a question in the Q&A box if you have any questions, um, feel free to do that.
Uh, the first question, does Boston IVF do sperm freezing for individuals looking to take estrogen? And how many vials should they store? Yeah, it's a great question. For um, assigned male of birth individuals who are looking to transition and start estrogen, um, we can do sperm freezing, uh, but I will say it's 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 a little bit more expensive at our center than doing so at a at a like a local sperm bank or cryobank. Um, so the the storage costs are well over a thousand dollars per year, whereas they can be a little bit less expensive at a at a local cryobank. So we typically refer patients out for that um, because it is going to be a little bit more cost effective for them down the line. Uh, but yes, that can be done. Um, typically, the recommendations um, that we defer to on this topic are actually looking at patients who are undergoing um, a treatment that's going to be gonadotoxic. So at least ten vials of sperm would be recommended to freeze. Some of this can be individual based on partner status, family building goals, you know, is IVF likely to be used or um, would they have an interest in um, having treatment with IUI? Um, so it's, it's a little bit individualized, but roughly 10 vials would be a very safe number um, to, um, to freeze before going on um, gender affirming hormones. Great. Thank you. For patients in this community, uh, should they come see a reproductive endocrinologist first or start with their primary care doctor for some testing? I think coming to see a fertility specialist is always helpful because we can kind of talk with them through, talk through with them the potential timeline. Um, we have a really easy way to get through all the testing that's cycle specific. Um, oftentimes for lesbian patients, we'll recommend doing a full workup, including a genetic testing panel, fallopian tube evaluation, which we can do in-house. And it's just a really good preparation for optimizing health, reviewing medications, um, and really optimizing their chances. I have some patients who will do the full workup and then proceed with home insemination. Uh, they're better equipped to do that. Um, once their fallopian tubes are evaluated, they know that there's no tubal factor. Um, and then some, some cases they'll, you know, they'll come back if they're not successful over the course of a few cycles and then, um, and then commence treatment with us. So that's also, that's also reasonable. Uh, but a full fertility workup is very helpful and it can also identify uh, the patient to any red flags or things that they may have not have anticipated um, in their, in the process of family building. Great. Uh, that's all the questions we have. Thank you so much. Oh, we just got one more question in. Sorry about that. Do patients hoping to use known donors have the option to waive the quarantine period and genetic screenings? How do you work with couples who are hoping to start with lower interventive care with IUI? Mm -hmm. So the second part of that question, um, the lower intervention care um, with with IUI, or maybe maybe you're even thinking about home insemination. Um, yes, we would still do a full workup uh, beforehand, and then offer them you know the option if they want to try home insemination first. It's, it's very reasonable. If it's just an IUI without any sort of medication or monitoring, that's definitely an option too. Patients can do home ovulation kit monitoring if they have regular menstrual cycles. Then that that can be a great option, and then just call us when they have a positive OPK, and then. Come in for insemination the next day. So yes, we offer that option too. As far as the known donor, um, we would not be waiving the genetic testing. If it's a medically appropriate to do the genetic testing, it likely should not be waived. Um, uh, or we, in some cases, we have the option of genetic counseling if it's a very rare condition. So it sort of depends on what the, what the clinical circumstances are, but I would always recommend the genetic evaluation for those very rare recessive carrier genes um, to make sure that patients are well counseled, that they don't have any, um, you know, overlapping genetic conditions. And then the quarantine period can be reduced um, if you're doing known donor um, uh, and, and, you know, the, the, the testing is generally evaluated uh, and found to be normal. So there are ways to decrease the timeline from the conventional six month um, that is often something that you hear about at, um, at the spur banks. Great. Um, another question came in, do you treat pediatric patients for fertility preservation? Did the quality of eggs retrieved for AFAB patients change if they had testosterone treatment? I don't know if you want to start there and then we can. Yeah. Yeah. 
Great question. Um, yes. So post-pubertal patients, we, we can treat at our center. Um, you know, it does require some, um, obviously it requires parental support. So it is something that we can do. Um, and so if you have a particular question about referral, I think it would be a good idea to reach out, um, reach out about that patient, particularly if there's some sensitivities there. Um, but yes, it is something that we have the capacity to do. We've treated patients under 18 years of age. Um, and similarly, we also do that for our uh, cancer patients as well for egg freezing. Um, as far as the quality of eggs retrieved from AFAB patients with testosterone, well, we don't believe so. Um, there were some decreased maturity rates, very similar uh, to PCOS patients that were observed in some of the cohorts, but the quality of embryos um, from the patients who actually created embryos um, instead of just freezing their eggs were very good. Um, and the success rates, um, everybody who had participated in that cohort of the five individuals who went to an embryo transfer had a, ultimately a successful outcome over the course of one, two or three transfers. So we, although there's not enough data to conclusively say that the quality of the eggs is not impacted, um, the outcomes that we have are fairly reassuring um, that there wasn't um, a, a, a significant detrimental effect to the testosterone. And then the other question is, if the patients received gender affirming surgery outside our system, can we store their eggs or sperm? Um, yeah, they could be shipped over um, for use. Yeah, that is something that we can do. Um, of course, the patients would want to know about the cost of storage um, and our long-term storage options, but yes, we can do that. And um, as far as how long can they be preserved? Um, likely, if they're under good storage conditions or ideal storage conditions, likely indefinitely, we don't know. I mean, honestly, we don't know because the field of uh, fertility is still fairly young. You know, the first IVF baby is about 45 this year. So gametes have not been stored for, for longer longer than that. So we, ju we just don't know. But under ideal storage conditions, they, they probably can be um, uh, stored for, for the patient's reproductive lifespan. Um, I have heard that some states are allowing children when they reach 18 to find out the do sperm donor or egg donor names. Uh, the the laws pertaining to this are quite variable by region. Um, so what we counsel patients on is that they're, it, it's sort of not really possible to have a truly anonymous donor experience any longer. Um, so, you know, non-identified would be probably the more appropriate terminology to use here. Um, and are all of our patients using donor gametes typically will participate in a social work discussion beforehand to understand the full, um, you know, the full kind of ramifications and better equip them to kind of handle um, handle this when their children comes of age and um, you know would be would be sort of wanting to answer this question for themselves. So um, there are um, varying laws about this. You know, if you are ever considering treatment or your patients are, you know, it'd be important for them to speak to a reproductive attorney if they have any questions, but these laws may change over time. And that's important for them to know it's not going to be an anonymous process. Um, any longer at the age of, you know, 23 and me, ancestry, all these genetic testing platforms, um, it's not likely that it will be truly, truly anonymous. Great. Uh, what if somebody doesn't want a full workup before trying IUI, healthy and young folks perhaps looking to save money? Great question, Nicole. Um, there, in most most of our states where uh, patients, you know, where we have um, where we have contracts, most patients do have coverage for fertility workup, even if they don't realize it. So there may not it may not be a huge cost um, to them, and it may provide a lot of beneficial information. So we would always run through the available testing. Now, one thing that comes to top of mind is really you're probably thinking about like an HSG as a fallopian tube evaluation needed before doing IUI. Most of the time, these are going to be normal for patients who don't have a history of STDs, no major pelvic or abdominal surgeries. So it is reasonable to make a plan to defer um, that, particularly if the patient has a lot of fear or anxiety about this invasive procedure. Um, and then perhaps um, complete that evaluation if not pregnant after maybe two or three inseminations. So yeah, there's there is definitely room for individualization. But um, 
just so you know, the patient will always be offered and recommended the full workup. And then uh, beyond that, if there's some extenuating circumstances or they don't want to complete it, um, then some sort of you know discussion will be had about options that exist. And then um, you know timelines by which, if not pregnant, the full workup should be completed. If you're doing um, treatment through insurance, um, insurance will typically require these types of tests. So that is something else that our patients have to consider too, um, if they are going through insured treatment, that the testing would be required prior to getting approval. Great. Well, that's all the questions we have for today. Thank you so much, Dr. Risakova, and thank you everyone for attending today's webinar. If you have any other questions, please contact Alyssa Cooper at ecooper at bostonivf.com. Once you leave today's webinar, you will receive a survey on the presentation. We would appreciate it if you would complete the survey and provide your feedback to help with future educational webinars. You will also receive a follow-up email within 24 hours with a link to view uh, to a recording of today's webinar. On behalf of Boston IVF and Dr. Risekova, thank you so much for joining to us today and have a great rest of your day.